Welcome to the Campbell Museums. A mundane object like a shoe buckle or a shoe clip has many stories it can tell. In this video, I explore just a few of these stories. Think of this video as the abridged history behind shoe buckles. This video is part of our What's in the Box series, where I pull a box from storage and see what we find inside. Check out the box number two playlist for more. Pilgrims did not wear shoe buckles. Yep, even that little detail isn't safe from embellishment in the American Thanksgiving mythology. In 1863, when President Lincoln made Thanksgiving a national holiday, Americans developed a narrative around this holiday that wasn't deeply rooted in historical scholarship. Instead, as with much Western imagery, artists took some creative liberties when illustrating our early colonists, and shoe buckles were part of this fantastical imagery. How do we know this? Our Thanksgiving holiday is in celebration of the first feast, which is claimed to have occurred in 1621. But the earliest known writing about shoe buckles is from January 22nd, 1660, when Samuel Pepys wrote in his diary, This day I began to put on buckles to my shoes. Almost 40 years after the famous feast, and Mr. Peps was certainly not 40 years behind the trend. Before the mid 1600s, shoes were mainly slip-on or used laces and ribbons to attach to the foot, and they were often decorated with ribbons and bows. Starting in the mid 1600s, men and women began to use straps to secure shoes to the foot. This meant that the elaborate ribbons and bows were replaced by eye-catching buckles. Shoe buckles were often sold separately from the shoes and were meant to be transferable from one pair to another. They were treated like jewelry, though they did not always contain gemstones. By 1720, 100 years after our fabled pilgrims supposedly wore them, shoe buckles were in universal use, except for the very poorest classes. Buckles are even immortalized in the classic counting rhyme describing the start to one's day with one, two, buckle my shoe. Buckles reached their peak of glory from 1760 to 1780 with the main adornment of one shoe channeled into the buckle. In the 1777 play, A Trip to Scarborough, Lord Foppington says, Formerly, indeed, the buckle was a sort of machine, intended to keep on the shoe. But the case is now quite reversed, and the shoe is of no earthly use but to keep on the buckle. Shoe buckles were primarily made in England during this period, and an estimated two and a half million pairs of buckles were produced annually. Then, in 1790, thanks to the French Revolution, the shoe buckle fell out of fashion. No one wanted to appear to be a member of the fresh aristocracy, so as a result, a less ostentatious style of dress was promoted. Many revolutionaries sold their buckles to support the cause. All these buckles sparkle like little diamonds, but diamonds they were not. As noted earlier, for most people, shoe buckles did not use actual gemstones. Shoe buckles often used paste stones to create their sparkle. Invented in 1758 by the Viennese goldsmith Joseph Strasser, paste is a high lead glass, which was more easily cut and shaped than diamonds. Paste was not meant to be an imposture for diamonds and was appreciated on its own merits. This brings us to our shoe clips. Our shoe clips most likely use paste stone to create their sparkle, but our shoe clips do not date to the 1700s. Instead, our shoe clips represent the resurgence in spectacular shoe adornment. During the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, shoe clips became a fixture of glamorous women's fashion. Shoe and dress clips are still in use to this day, but mainly reserved for formal events. Mundane objects can contain big stories, and these shoe clips had a lot to say. What other stories might they tell? <laughs>